are going to present you to the webinar about deep fakes detection and prevention and how you can protect your identity in 2024. So to start off with, uh, or it's going to be a little bit of introduction about the webinar, like what we're going to talk about in the webinar, uh, the speakers and host profiles, the introduction about our speakers, the industry experts, and about fascia profile, like why fascia has uh, opted for this webinar and why we want to create awareness about this and what is the importance of deep fake detection and prevention. So moreover, we have expert who is going to talk about the regularities and how you can protect your identity in 2024. And last but not the least, we're going to conclude the webinar. And next on, so in this webinar, we're basically, uh, basically going to discuss about the deep fake technology and how it is impacting individuals and the societies, the can defect trends, cases, and how it has evolved over time. Furthermore, we're going to talk about how you can stay safe, protect your identity, and in the world of deep fakes and identity theft. So the basic highlights that we're going to talk about in this webinar are what is the deep fake technology, like understand the deep fakes, then how it is evolving all over the world, all in the digital realm, yeah? And then we're going to talk about defect awareness in 2024, how you can protect yourself and how you should you guys be aware and what are the risks, the challenges, detection or prevention uh, strategies, and last but not the least, question and answers with the industry expert as we have Tony Allen, Mujadid, and Saul. So following out the speakers, uh, Tony, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? First, I would like to say like, it's an honor having you on board. Uh, Tony is age assurance and digital identity expert. Tony, please uh, introduce <laughs> yourself a little bit. Yeah, thanks. I'm uh, yeah, I'm Tony Allen. I'm uh, chief executive of the Age Check Certification Scheme, and uh, I am a subject matter expert in age assurance and um, identity assurance. Uh, we test the ID and age check systems work. And fundamentally, uh, what we do with that is looking at whether or not um, uh, good quality age and ID assurance systems can detect deep fake attack and other types of attack. Um, so this is an area of real interest um, to us. Uh, I'm also leading a, a number of projects, uh, which I'll come to talk about a bit later on in some more detail. But one of them in particular is a joint project between the United Kingdom and Switzerland on the development of deep fake detection uh, test tools and techniques. So I'll be interested to speak about that a bit later as well. Uh, once again, Tony, thank you for uh, being a part of this webinar and uh, helping us create awareness among everybody you know. And uh, it's been an honor to have you on board. So next, uh, we have Saad, who is really a great marketing strategy and a great lead generator expert. So Saad, would you like to introduce yourself a bit? Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks for the introduction. So basically, the reason that this uh, comes off as such a topic of great re relevance is because when we talk about and we discuss how do we um, educate the masses and how do we um, uh, make people aware of the threats that are emerging in 2024 going into this year, it's been um, a couple of incidents that we've recently noted. Um, so yes, whenever we get down to talk about um, creating awareness about defect technology or the threats that emerge, uh, I think there's always a discussion in the room that involves marketing experts as well. Um, we think of our jobs as beyond um, just selling products and services, but also as a social responsibility to the society. Um, and I think as uh, the technology becomes more sophisticated, it uh, is a massive uh, role for us as well to focus on creating that level of fairness, um, get the real insight from experts such as Tony and Mujadat on how their particular organizations or whatever they're presenting, how they're working towards to, uh, to battling this uh, problem in the modern age. So what we really want is that we take that information from them, simplify it for the audiences and create a massive level of awareness on how people can protect their identities. Um, thank you, Subhan. You're welcome. So next we have uh, Mr. Mujadid, who is our CEO of Fascia, a visionary entrepreneur, entrepreneur who is uh, currently at the helm of thriving AI startup Fascia that specializes in facial recognition technology. 
Uh, with a focus on aggressive growth, he has successfully guided expansion of Asia across multiple continents and secured almost the funding of around like 1.2 million in August 2023. And uh, it's an honor, sir, uh, having you on board. So please uh, give us a little bit of introduction and about yourself and about Fasia, please. Uh, thank you, Saban. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, this topic of deepfake is uh, is sort of a bit really close to my heart. Uh, this is because uh, uh, working in identity space for the past couple of years, uh, what we have seen is that um, the threat has been expanding um, and it's, it has been increasing exponentially, exponentially. And the effect that it has on the lives, people's life um, is uh, is very heartening. And, and we want to change people's life and we want to help them uh, have a digital identity, secure digital identity. Um, that is why um, being an entrepreneur, being an, a problem solver, um, we at Fascia establish a facial recognition system um, that detects defects, that is prone to these spoof attacks. We we have developed a technology uh, that is uh, catering to 50, 56 plus types of spoof attempts and 100% def uh, defect free. Um, this is a a remarkable achievement that Fascia has achieved. Um, our vision as a company is to uh, protect digital identities worldwide. Um, that is why we have established ourselves as a global player, uh, and we want to be we want to raise awareness globally, not just in UK, uh, but uh, through Middle East, through Asian countries, and through uh, the North America. Perfect, sir. So would you like a little bit of, like, uh, tell about the solutions that Fascia provides and how it's helping the society grow a little bit more? Okay. Um, when I established Fascia, it was a face recognition system for P2P. Actually, um, um, the need of establishing Fascia came when, once my mother was traveling on uh, one of ride-hailing um, ride services. I don't want to name it here. Uh, but uh, the issue was that the driver was not the person who was on the app. Um, and I wanted to reach out to her, but I couldn't due to some network error. Uh, and I called the ride hailing service to get her whereabouts. And they said, the, the actually, they called the driver and driver's at home and someone else is driving this car and they can't reach out to them. Uh, and I seriously got uh, scared a lot of uh, what could happen. Uh, your mind really boggles and you really go scared. I, I was really very scared at that moment. Um, hopefully, luckily, uh, she came home uh, safely. Um, but then we, uh, me and my partner, uh, thought of a way there should be some mechanism to stop this uh, identity theft and identity problem. And then we come up with, with a face recognition system that um, we to develop it together. Um, but once we entered into the industry um, and marketed a product, we realized that the use cases are endless and the need for such a service is uh, beyond P2P, beyond uh, businesses, but, uh, but impacting actual people's life. Um, that is when the threat of defect uh, was uh, introduced to us and we, we immediately thought that this is something we need to stop on uh, on masses level so that um, it really helps people uh, solve a problem and stay safe uh, and and literally help people save save people from ruining their lives due to defects. Perfect, perfect. So moving on, we're going to uh, so tell us a little bit about like how any layman can understand like he's or she is watching a defect or it's a defect that she or he is encountering. So what would you like to say about it? Like, how uh, would you like us to, you know, like, for example, I don't know anything about a defect. How would you, you know, like help me understand it? Okay, um, a defect uh, for your understanding, a defect is a simple image that has been altered or manipulated through AI or through any system, to any tool, simple. Uh, earlier it was uh, people used to do like, tools like uh, digital Photoshop tools or any photo editing tools. Uh, and they used, to use, they used to use such tools to manipulate uh, or uh, change someone's image. 
and use it for different uh, purposes uh, to steal the identity, to threaten them, uh, blackmail them, and and what and what not. Um, with the advancement with AI, this has been changed from a whole process to just few prompts. Uh, you can send in just one to two prompts, and you can literally make a defect uh, within minutes. Like, uh, as you can see on the slides, there's one real image and there's one defake image of mine. Uh, I created this to create awareness about on defake, how easy it is. I just Google it. Uh, and within a few minutes, I was on the tool that managed to defake it. Uh, you can see that uh, it has enhanced my beard. My, my nose is different. My glasses are different. Uh, and uh, it's completely changed how, how I look. Uh, so it's so easy for someone else to impersonate me now. Uh, yes. and this is the actually issue with the impersonation, uh, stealing my identity and using my name to uh, leverage uh, my banking detail or my, uh, any other anything, any pretty that, that is um, illegal. So let's just ask the audience, the participants, about defake, uh, defakes, like have they ever encountered defake or not? Let's see what uh, our, what does our participant say, yeah? So that we can know about like what everyone else feels about it. And after that, we're gonna you know discuss their answers, like how many people said yes or no. So let's see. So, Saad, would you like to say something about it, uh, about understanding defakes, or have you ever encountered defake, or how do you deal with this situation? I think uh, it's a very valid point in terms of how easy it is nowadays to create defakes. Now, let's say um, if this was an experiment where Mujadda just went on to Google, he went on to the second or third link, and randomly just inserted a video of his. Um, so if it, it is this easy for people to create defakes, um, then how easy it is to misrepresent or steal someone's identity. And you know, we, we use so much face recognition technology to unlock our devices, to log into our banking apps. Um, and what is it um, that we currently feel is that it's the most safest way because for surely no one can replicate our face. Um, but that that's a huge myth that that has been debunked, especially in the last couple of years. Um, this is this could have devastating effects. I think we've we already have um, a good amount of research on it. Uh, there's been so many cases. We've recently um, experienced how that happened with one of the biggest pop stars in the world. And it is seriously alarming that we um, need people to, obviously, first of all, as I see the poll as well, there's a 30% of individuals who haven't encountered defects. So we, uh, as we move into 2024, as we move into more innovative technology, um, there has to be a significant level of fairness where people can actually, from a certain distance, or let's say at a first glance, can recognize that there is something wrong with this video. Because if that doesn't happen soon, um, it could be a problematic situation for families, for closed ones, um, for your loved ones, because if you're seeing disturbing videos of someone else and you don't know that they're fake, um, then it creates a very undesirable situation. And that's us talking about on a very, uh, let's say, basic, non-technical level. So if we go up on the technical ranks, and I'm sure uh, both Tony and Mujad could have more insight on it, um, I think the story just gets keeps getting scarier. And uh, I, I've pledged myself to uh, constantly focus on raising awareness related to this. So uh, we have almost 81, uh, 84 percent people participated for the poll. So I'm go just going to end the poll and see the results here. So what we see here is, I hope you can see it on your windows as well. So almost 36 percent people say yes, they have encountered. And 27 percent of these people say no. And Almost 36 people say, 36% uh, people say they're not sure. So it means like people are not basically properly aware about the defects. So I think uh, this topic should be, you know, like should be spread all over the world a lot so that everyone knows that what are they, you know, 
uh, what are they looking at? So moving on further. So how are the fake mates? So uh, I think uh, with the technical aspects, uh, Mr. Majada would like, uh, we would love that if you would give us a little bit of the technical aspect of this as well. Okay, uh, with uh, creating deepfake is a lot easier um, these days. Uh, with AI models that are uh, accurate to the down to the pixel level, uh, they change the pixel level, changing minute details that um, it is becoming harder and harder for um, companies for uh, to detect these defects. You, you just need a simple image, any image, uh, any old image would work as well. You can literally um, age, change the age of the image of the of the individual. Uh, any prompt that you give, you select a few frames, you post it on the tool, AI tool, easier, it's instant, and you just give a few prompts, um, like um, change the hair, um, give any results, um, change the nose, um, change the complexion or anything that you want to change, just give a few prompts, uh, you, you get the results instantly. Um, and you, the problem is that AI learns over time as well. Uh, with, uh, with as sophisticated uh, attacker you are, the more, the more you teach, the more data you put in, into the AI, the more accurate results it performs. Uh, and with um, instant results, with this technology, results are instant and literally you can't differentiate on a naked eye. And you have to go and you have to get tools like Facia or any other tool to determine that this is the fake and this has been altered through AI. Yeah, perfect. So Saad, uh, due to the marketing aspect, it's, you have been, you know, you surf all uh, the web a lot and you know about the market trends and everything. So I would like to ask like how many uh, platforms are there almost, the, just uh, a round figure, or what do you think? Like how many platforms are there uh, through which you can make a defect online without, you know, like giving your email addresses and, you know, like every registration process and without paying them and how much time does it take? So, um, so if you ask me how many, uh, I don't think so. I would have a number in mind because there are so many. So let's say you want to, um, you want to remove a background image from from just an image. So when you sort of put it in uh, Google or any search engine, you get so many options there, and it's almost similar to that now. It's that alarming because there are tools, there are free tools, so they would give you bad quality defects that would be detectable very easily. I mean, you and me would know that there's something wrong with the video, and there are tools that actually get you to pay for it. So when they get you to pay for it, they spend a significant amount of time as compared to they do not, even if they don't do it in seconds, they have iterations. By iterations, I mean, is that you keep feeding that prompts, you keep feeding them more information, um, you keep feeding them more images or uh, uh, footages from the ex from the uh, original uh, footage that you're trying to defake on, and it keeps learning. So what it does is that, for example, if it's my face and I want to superimpose it onto your face right now, if I keep giving the system different angles of your face or the environment that you're in, it will continuously learn and eventually it will create a deep fake uh, that doesn't look fake. And that is the whole point of it. So just like any other subscription-based model, just like any other paid tools or paid solutions, there are actually uh, deep fake creation applications. And you pay, uh, I remember experimenting with one of those. I paid $20 and it gave me the option of five faces. Uh, and the quality was again, remarkable. So I think it's the process itself, uh, as long as it's backed by AI, it will keep improving. I think that's something that we can all uh, take from it. And this is the way to combat it as well. As we keep feeding information on how to detect them, our protection models um, will improve as well. And I think this is something that Mujadud would be able to relate to as well. And uh, uh, we want to obviously uh, have systems that detect them with a hundred percent success rate, uh, but I believe achieving that universally or globally is still a long way to go. Yeah, and uh, let's see whether twenty twenty four takes us. Okay, so, so um, uh, the the problem is that each with each passing day, 
there's a new deep fake thread that's passing. Um, we we are cost we have we have to constantly on on our toes on to update our models to cater to the the fix. Uh, they have been very uh like so sophisticated deep fakes like um on naked eye literally uh people would say these are real images and when we um when we expanded on a 3d level and expanded through our AI models um we see on a pixel level that these uh they have they lack consistency and they lack uh we have our own modeling uh techniques to determine that these are um deep fakes Perfect. So, uh, just a basic question from my side, uh, and for the viewers to understand, like, how much time does it take to make a defect on if you if you're doing it online uh, through any website or something? Less than like if if you have done it before, it will literally take you one minute. Uh, for a first for doing for the first time, it might take you three to four minutes, but it doesn't take longer than that. It's just like uploading an image. And then yeah. you know it gives that's you a result. Right. Yeah, that's that's one of the key aspects as well. That there's no special information and knowledge that you require to just impersonate someone. Um, um, and, and once recently, we obviously take this. Recently, there was a case in Spanish town, a small, very small Spanish town, like literally a population of few thousands, uh, less than a few thousands, um, like almost uh, three hundred families. Uh, and there and there about 20 uh, minors uh, from ranging from 13 to 17 years old and their deep fakes were all over the network social network um and, and the 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 problem is that uh, the the person the people who created um these deep fakes were young boys um they the the fun of the aspects in uh, creating a deep fake awareness is that uh, anytime when you create a refake of someone else is impersonating and is legal illegal and you are doing um that is criminal activity and you, we need to create awareness that this is not right and you on uh, under any circumstances you should not create anyone else deep fake um this literally shatters their life and their families have been uh, under a lot of uh, pressure over socially and and like this is very uh, heartwarming and very sad that uh, that it's so easy that a simple uh, teenager could make this. I think that that brings me to another question as well, and I think uh, I believe Tony would be a better prospect to answer it. So let's say we've got underage boys um, making these deep fakes and circulating around them. How do we create regulation around it? Um, because if you're impersonating someone or you're leaking their information, um, if it leads to, let's say, financial or physical or personal fraud, so do you uh, categorize it as a juvenile offense or it's an adult category? Or maybe that is the current challenge that we have. So uh, if I bring my question to Tony, how would you answer it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> one of the things that, it, it, to bear in mind, this is already illegal. It, in most countries, it's already illegal to uh, you know, falsify something, try to trick somebody, try to create a fraud, uh, try to uh, manipulate data um, uh, to to commit fraud or to or to extract um, uh, uh, money in particular or, or property out of it. it. That generally speaking is already already illegal and. You know whether or not um, uh, that law applies to children does depend on where you are. So you have a uh, in most countries you have what's called an age of criminal responsibility, which here in the UK is ten. In Scotland, it's it's fourteen. In different parts of the world, it's different ages. So it just depends on where, where you are. Um, one of the difficulties, though, is that there are some things that people are doing that are not about actually extracting money or committing fraud, but just to cause harm and distress. And so, um, you know, deep fake. We've had Taylor Swift with um, with uh, deep fake uh, pornography uh, in the news very recently. And yes, that was about actually getting money because they were trying to get views onto their site, so therefore build up their money that we're getting through from those views. But where that's not somebody who's famous, and you're not going to get those views. It's just about causing, uh, you know, personal alarm and distress to deep fake. Um, uh, you know, one of your, you know, 
an ex girlfriend or, uh, or or somebody that you know that you just want to um, uh, upset you you deep fake um, uh, pornography uh, of them, and and the problem with that is that is often isn't illegal in part in in most parts of the world. Um, it is very soon going to become illegal here in the UK and in various other bits of the world. Um, but it's uh, that's one that does need tackling through some uh, some regulation. Uh, whether or not with it, when regulation, we'll probably come to talk a bit more about regulation. But whether or not you have regulation, that doesn't solve the problem. The regulation is the um, is the is the stick to be able to deal with somebody who you catch as an offender. It doesn't stop them offending unless it's very very draconian regulation. Um, so uh, generally speaking, people don't murder each other because they know they're going to go to the prison for the rest of their lives at the very least, if not face death penalties themselves. But people will very often travel at more than the speed limit uh, when they're driving their car because they know the chances of getting caught are pretty slim. And even if they did get yeah. caught, uh, they're going to get a, a penalty notice or some sort of um, uh, enforced um, uh, training, uh, depending on where you are. So for the regulations to be, you know, that effective, they have to be very, very draconian to stop people from doing them. So actually what you need is technological solutions. Uh, yeah. You need the, the battle needs to be uh, between the AIs, the AIs for the good and the AIs for the bad. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of um, the, the example you give that people know that they're going to be punished, but they don't go around stop murdering people so the focus has to be on the defenses um good ai versus bad ai um, we have a lot of ethical hackers often working to um check the proficiency of networks and i think this something needs to be similar in terms of uh the emerging threats from everything as well and that obviously brings us to our next slide where we discuss the technology improve uh, the improvement and i think we've talked plenty about how machine learning does it. It does, It just gets um, all of the information and uses it to improve itself uh, in the most basic sense of the word. Um, and I think um, you can probably shed more light onto this. Certainly. Um, as you can see, uh, from 2017 to 2023, um, the quality and the detail in the skin and the eyes have significantly improved. Uh, and to the naked eye, it's literally impossible to diagnose a defect these days and they are so accurate um, and they're so easy to make um, with generative AI like it is it is re how remarkable that technology uh, can be used for so in, so such a bad way perfect so uh, talking about uh, the evolution moving on We'll discuss about the, what are the applications. Like first, uh, please uh, shed some light on the negative applications, and then the other ones. Um, as discussed, um, uh, like we have previously discussed, one of the Taylor Swift case is is a perfect example these days. Um, that could be of uh undesired other videos. Um, um, so as Tony mentioned, that um, there people are doing uh, there's. Unfortunately, um, there's revenge pond as, as well um, that's prevalent through defects. Um, more importantly, um, if you remember the last few elections as well, um, where the political campaigns were totally, um, totally disrupted through uh, defect videos of Donald Trump. Um, these um, the defects are are like they are accurate audio they have or accurate audio they have uh, impeccable recognition in terms of uh, um in facial cues yes sir i think um if if we put it in sort of a nutshell it's that there could be so many negative applications because that's all about it it is i think what we really need to maybe discuss more is that the, the, the technology came into being with positive applications in mind. Uh, I think we have it somewhere because obviously going throughout the presentation, we have the uh, discussion of how it is impacting the the, the greater impact. But th there was a time when it was the, it emerged as something uh, to be useful enough. 
and uh, you know there are there are certain things let's say in most parts parts of the world people may feel that pornography itself it has no inherited positive value um but this technology this the the superimposing of one face onto another it was actually being used for good uh, purposes as well um, we've outlined some examples here and uh, especially the david beckham one is 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 a very good example it's it's for a social cause because when you talk about films and movies it's again uh, it's it's commercial it's people trying to uh, okay they're trying to pay tribute but they're also trying to finish a movie but if people could relate to david beckham speaking in their own language and they're able to um uh, sort of uh, let's say act on it that is something that we can uh, attribute positively to the to this technology um this this obviously brings me to uh, discussing uh with both of you that does the regulation mean that we allow it on a large commercial scale and uh, maybe uh, create a stringent process to vet anyone who wants to use this technology i mean should could there be central distribution um tony do you have any thoughts on it yeah you got no chance of achieving that is my my general view that you know once it's out there i mean the the technology isn't that difficult the uh the the program of it isn't that difficult um the 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 capacity of the machines is a bit difficult in terms of you know the amount of uh processing power you need to be able to uh, to do this um but it's out there and it's it's in the world and uh, and, and getting it back in the box is not not really a, a runnable um, option, I don't think. I would add one more to your negative applications, though, and that is people using it to evade controls. Um, so using it to evade um, uh, age restrictions, for instance, when you're uh, accessing um, uh, online services or, or goods uh, using face age estimation as the as the methodology. So deep fake is a a negative application there. It, there are some positive applications. The positive applications are a bit for me a bit thin on the ground. Yeah. Um, but there, there are some there. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 the rush for this, the rush to create all this, the, the, the people who are engaged in this are uh, about negative applications, and and I don't think you can get that back in the box. And even if you could, where do you regulate that? So you regulate that in the UK. A lot of this stuff comes from uh, Russia. But which of course the UK has got no jurisdiction over, or from uh, China or other countries with uh, uh, out out there on the internet, um, you've got it, 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 you know trying to regulate it isn't the isn't the solution. The, the solution is most definitely having the tech to detect it and having the individual resilience of, of of users on the internet to understand what it is and what to look out for and what the risks are associated with it. Absolutely. I actually uh, completely 100% agree with uh, Tony here. Uh, once this technology is out of the box, there's, there's no coming way. It's a free world. Um, like there are 260 countries connected together. Um, so how can you stop this service from one smaller country um, and regulation won't be suffice? As previously discussed, like we people, if it's easy, if it's convenient for them to generate a deep fake, uh, they would literally and they could move out uh, scot free uh, as example of uh, over speeding that we catered, uh, quoted earlier so there is no coming back uh, once this technology goes out um, we we can't shut it down um, and it will be harder and harder for us to uh, companies like fisher or other companies cater to these effect and protecting the real identities digitally Perfect. So let's just run a poll that says how much do you trust AI technology to accurately detect deepfakes? Let's see what the audience says about it. Yes. So yeah. and, I, and we've also put up we some. can discuss uh, whether the people yeah. are also aware of it or how much does they trust the technology about it. Yeah. So Saul, please go on with slides. Yeah, we've put up a basic uh, impact slide as well to uh, determine how much damage it has caused over time. So, as you can see in these four, all of these four points, all the bullet points say is like there has been a great increase in the deepfakes technology, 
and how people are using it in different sites and in different industries as well. So, Saad, can you explain a little bit about like how much industry do you think are affected by it and which industries are the most uh, that are affected by deep fakes and uh, the identity theft thing? I think, uh, of course, we've, we, we've discussed a lot about the, the impact itself. Uh, what happens is that, look at this app, the deep new app, it, it got shut down, but it had 95,000 active users. And that number of active users on different platforms, if we gathered the data of all of them together, it, it must have doubled or tripled by now. And there's, there's so much going into revenge porn or, or people using it to mislead um, other individuals that it's, it's impossible for uh, for any individual or local regulatory authority to sort of uh, circle it down. Um, the the widespread impact, what it does is that it takes away the power from any sort of regulatory agencies, um, which is why the idea is right. And uh, the focus should be on how uh, we can combat this with technology, because uh, it's not going to be easy on how to regulate it, on how to categorize it, because you know, as, as we talked about earlier about the negative applications and how um, someone gave the example of, 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 of somebody in being involved in murder. So what happens is that it usually happens on a certain geographical location. Uh, location. So you, all of the crimes that do happen like that, you have certain jurisdictions to follow according to where the person is. Um, with with internet-based crimes, with cyber crimes, that is also a huge challenge because you cannot you have multiple jurisdictions interacting between them. And then you have to get the uh, central uh, regulatory or uh, law enforcement agencies. So um, I think, yes, moving on, we've discussed the impact. Uh, we've discussed uh, the Taylor Swift case recently, but there has been massive financial losses from this. Uh, this The one financial loss that happened with deep fake video calling and the other with um, deep fake voice cloning. So we want our audiences to know that it's not just um, videos or images that that can be circulated, but it's the uh, the audio and voice impact as well. And this recently happened in the U.S. elections in the preliminaries. That candidates of local small towns um, they were called with deep fake audios of the, uh, the 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 ones that were fighting for places. And that eventually had an impact on the results because the forensics team could not uh, come back together uh, with the results soon enough. And there was a, let's say, a 40 hour, eight hour delay. Uh, what that caused was that people uh, changed their narratives. So this is on a major scale because if people are going to uh, shape their political narratives based on fake information, imagine where the world would go from there. Um, Moving on, I think we have to talk about uh, the current detection challenges. And I think one of the uh, key people, we've, we've discussed about the regulation challenges as well, and I think we'll dive, dive more deeper into it. But let's, from a technology perspective, what are the current re detection challenges that we face? And uh, Mujadud, how is Patia, uh overcoming these challenges? Okay, um, when it comes to fascia, we are constantly updating our AI models. We have developed over 500 models just to cater to the fake. Uh, we recently revamped our technology uh, from scratch um, to and to cater to these enhanced sophisticated defect. Um, uh, we launched our AI model Morphe's uh, um, that cater to this single image defect attack. Um, they have been so much um realistic uh with with time uh, that um uh, we we have been on our toes all the time and constantly updating our technology that we believe is very sophisticated uh, and we we on uh, are confident that we could uh, control or stop or uh, not let any of the deep fake or spoof attack pass our system. Um, we actually got uh, uh, I beta. That is why it's one of the deep play attacks, uh, deep fake attack, cater to deep fake attacks. Perfect. So we got a question here. 
and uh, I think we're going to discuss it in the last. We should. It's better if we discuss it in the last. First, we go with uh, the basic. Uh, what uh, we have to tell the people about deep fakes and everything. And in the end, we're going to discuss all the questions, right? So please carry on with the presentation, and we'll get back to the questions in the end. Sure. Um. So, I think uh, when we talk about the current challenges, detection challenges, uh, we focus back and uh, we really want more information on how uh, we can have uh, significant legal frameworks that can protect people. Uh, I'm not saying that we can protect the creation of defects. I'm just saying or trying to um, you know get more information from uh, Tony, who is a regulatory expert as well on how uh, once the act has been committed, on how do we make sure that we give sort of enough what you call conviction that it actually discourages people from uh, creating or misrepresenting someone again? Because I think it closely links with uh, uh, the, the cases with children as well, because uh, especially in the UK, we've seen uh, that there's absolutely zero tolerance policy on any sort of pedophilia. Um, we, they make it public enough. And I, I think that's a really good strategy to prevent that because you put them out in the open, um, the, the, the ones who offend uh, children. So how do you think that we can do, do you think that a similar framework could follow for defects as well? So uh, there, there's a, in England, uh, there's an old English court um, uh, judgment that uh, the, 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 uh, the judge, the master of the roles at the time said, uh, justice must not only be done, it must mass manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. And that is, uh, you know, I've got to flow through all kinds of anything to do with regulation. That you, you, having the regulations there is one thing. Having justice associated with those regulations, it has to be seen to be done. It has to be effective. It has to be um, in people's consciousness to even, um, even understand that it's a, a regulation. Uh, anybody who's ever run a business will know that there are hundreds and hundreds of regulations the public has never even heard of. Uh, as <laughs> never even come across, um, but they they yeah. know as a business they they have to uh, they have to comply with them, and so but the public might not, not even know that they're they're regulations. Um, you do need the regulations there, so don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to uh, denigrate the idea of there being regulation uh, because they have to be there because they're the kind of the backstop to um, uh, being able to do something. They're the things that enable the enforcement community to act. But really, before you get to regulation, you should be looking for um, what we do, which is certification. And that is, you know, the people who are out there doing an honest, good job, the people who are out there doing, uh, trying to be correct, trying to be what they do and trying to do it properly. They, if they are certified and they're independently certified by a third party conformity assessment body that checks what they do, understands what they do and issues certification for that, the marketplace should react with um, uh, effectively the people who aren't certified being squeezed out economically, um, being squeezed out from uh, being able to participate in legitimate um, uh, activity. And, and that means that it, although uh, fraud is possible to do, it's difficult to do at scale. It's, diffi it's difficult to do in terms of having... Uh, and being a a, a a a massive industry, the more you put certification and those sorts of um, honest, trusted frameworks and brokers um, into uh, into place, um, and you achieve that by having good quality standards, about having a good um, regulatory and standards infrastructure with accreditation, certification, trust framework schemes, um, etc. And by that being recognised and trusted by uh, industry and by uh, relying parties, the people who are using this this technology. And then the backdrop is those that aren't doing that, that aren't doing the, the uh, certification process, they should be coming to the uh, much more ready attention of um, uh, the law enforcement uh, community and, and agencies. Uh, and just as an analogy, um, about 20 or so years ago, you would regularly see toys, children's toys, on the marketplace, uh, which contained high levels of cadmium and lead, which are poisonous to humans. And that was regularly, uh, you would see that in paints and all sorts of things in the 1980s, 1990s, probably more than 20 years ago, to be fair. 
in those in that period we brought in uh regulations to ban that practice and they were still coming out and they were still developing and they were still turning up and then we brought in certification we brought in uh what, uh, what in europe is called en 71 that requires you to get those toys certified now nobody buys those products in any of the legitimate industry or legitimate world or any supermarkets or toy shops or anybody buys those products and so although they still do exist they are now so rare they're actually probably more valuable than the real toys because they're that rare um, that you don't see them because there's no economic marketplace for that uh, for them to work in uh, and that's taken yes that's taken 25 30 years to achieve that change in behavior but now it's so rare and unusual to come across toys that have got high levels of lead and cadmium in them uh, particularly in the uh, regulated marketplaces that uh, they just aren't made anymore they don't exist and that's really where you want to get to with this regulatory challenge i think it comes from people not knowing about it initially um the the consequences of using that um using of, of their children using those toys and once that settled in there was absolutely zero tolerance for them to use but the only challenge here is that apart from you know they wanted to create a product and sell it um you talked about it yourself this is not just a financial problem anymore it's being used for revenge purposes as well which makes it even more challenging because then you have to really intervene in terms of a law, law enforcement agency and you know uh now that's true but the people who make it want to make money so there are people out there that are just serving the revenge porn. They, the people who, who make the technology to be able to do the revenge porn, they want to make money. They are they are commercially driven, uh, commercially operating. Um, the the uh, the people who are using the service might not want to make money or might not want to engage in fraud. They might just want to have a bit of fun or do something that they think is perfectly harmless. Um, but the people who make the technology and are, are doing are doing it for a commercial purpose. I think yeah, um, I think, yeah. Uh, I sort of yeah, agree with uh, Tony here. Um, we um, as as a company at Stacia, we are trying to raise the awareness uh, through all through all the fronts, from from uh, raising awareness to the people, to raising awareness as a business, as our own processes, uh, what our values are, and similarly raising uh, the standards uh, of uh, technology. To cater to these defects and stop these defects at the very beginning. Yeah, I think uh, exactly. Uh, we really want to go back to uh, point zero where where it's originating from. Um, just a little information for our, our audiences. So, uh, if if you want to follow very simple basic steps, uh, and you know want to avoid all sort of uh, replication of your images. Uh, with so much social media going on, there's obviously untrusted sources as well. Um, so look for very basic signs. Um, again, uploading any sort of photos on untrusted sources, that's got to be your go-to number one. And then again, it's the use of sharing of person or sensitive information. Uh, I think that's a lot of awareness that's created by other agencies as well, in terms of how you do not submit details on your emails and everything. Uh, but yes, if you do upload any sort of media, uh, that is something uh, you should look for, the the, the source of the site. Uh, but moving forward, uh, there are certain things that are very prevalent. And we've, we've done that this in collaboration with Fascia to discuss how high-end defect manipulations are, of course, facial transformations. We've got the audio and voice cloning as well. But some defects, uh, you can... If you're able to grasp a basic concept at the first look, it may save you uh, from a lot of things. Uh, there was this case where a father actually uh, saw an image of her 17-year-old daughter. The image was forged. It was a deep fake. Um, before going to any sort of confirmations, he went and uh, confronted his daughter. Uh, the the obviously the it was a massive sort of a dis disagreement it led to uh, an almost fatal case for the daughter herself because she had absolutely no idea what had been done. So for such cases, if you come across something that looks off, that doesn't look right, just keep paying attention to the cheeks and foreheads, to the eyes and eyebrows, pay attention to the glasses, the glares, um, the facial hair, because 
a lot of defects. There's still, I would say, 60 to 70% uh, defects that aren't, um, you know, that proficient in terms of how they look. So if you keep looking closely, you will detect them. So this is a basic level of awareness and uh, keep focusing the, on the source as well. Where does this video come from? Does this come from a source that you may not trust generally? Uh, and I think uh, this has to be happening on a micro level as well. Uh, because if an individual himself does the due diligence, there may be a 30 to 40% chance that he does not let it uh, pass through or circulate through uh, by categorizing it himself as a deep fake. Um, if you, two of you want to share any more thoughts on how we can take this maybe a level ahead. I, I think I would just uh, add to that list really. I mean, um, these are all things that, uh, deep fake detection tools could be programmed to look for. So if you, uh, you know, whilst a human being might not spot that the shadow under your nose doesn't move when you speak, a um, a deep fake detection tool built into uh, identity uh, proofing systems can spot that because it's at a pixel level. Uh, and the other thing that's uh, really interesting about deep fake, the, well, the problem is, of course, with all of that list of six here is that they'll just get better and they'll start to... Um, deal with those those issues. But the other thing is that it, uh, IT is sometimes almost too perfect. Um, when we when we speak, when we speak naturally, you hear when I speak, I'm, I've got a particular trait where I tend to repeat the first couple of words of a line. When, <laughs> when I do it, I, so I'll say the same thing twice. When you listen to me, you notice that I'm doing it, and I notice that I'm doing it, which is uh, uh, not so great. But Deep fakes can't cope with that. The 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 the, the sinking can't cope with it. The, uh, um, the 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 ums and the ers that you put in naturally into sentences, deep fake finds difficult to to replicate and and to spot. Uh, and then the other thing on your slide in relation to you know sharing your information, uh, the one thing that I've always said to people about uh, whatever you do, whatever you do online, whatever your world is online, whatever your passwords are online, whatever you say about yourself online, whatever you do online, make sure what you do for your bank is different. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good advice. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I feel like the uh, as socially connected we are these days, um, we need to take a step back and, and make our social world a bit more private. The, our profile pictures should not be accessible to anyone. Um, um, just friends. The close, the how close our social circle is, uh, is the better it is to prevent these defects. Um, when it comes to uh de detecting a defect, um, we have one of the most advanced AI detecting these defects. Uh, and we offer help to anyone who posts anything or help seeks our help. To detect a defect, we will uh, offer them as support, as much support as we can. Uh, these pointers that we have shared are for a common person uh, who has some, who's just uh, happened to come upon some defect and wants to judge it based on certain cues uh, that they could see. Um, but uh, as Tony said, with advancement in technology, this, uh, this, this is this is going to be obsolete within literally within a few weeks or a few months, uh, this list would be obsolete and we would have to um, take help with the tools or more AI models and AI technology such as Aspasia to help uh, cater to these defects. I think we've discussed all of these in plenty. Um, yeah. The kind of things that Defect does. Yeah, there's, deep there's again. yeah, extortion, identity theft. Um, like uh, the use cases are uh getting out of hand these days. Um, simple threat of a phone call just to uh, get a few bucks is common now. Uh, with the voice of your our loved ones. Uh, we 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 have seen the case of uh this uh business a bank Hong Kong bank that manipulated through defect uh um uh, sending over millions of dollars uh to the defect account yeah 25 million dollars yeah um so again what are the id verification companies doing about it uh 
this is uh, Majid, could you quickly yeah. shed some light on it? We um no, there are multiple checks that we do. We are providing onboarding technology, uh, facilitating cross device uh, onboarding to give uh, uh, a sense of trust between the businesses and the end users being the uh, daily users of services. We, uh, the technology we have provided bias-free testing, enhanced our technology. Uh, we are constantly raising awareness um, for the people to protect their identity, for the businesses to have uh, robust processes to manage their uh, users, their their customers' identity and onboard only real users so that they could uh, prevent financial loss or uh, emotional loss or any um, uh, loss of information as well. Like there's a lot of uh, uh, subsequent losses that are associated with breaches. We uh, we at Kesia we have recently um, introduced our new AI model Morphix uh, that is specifically catering to defect and we are uh, we using this model to develop a defect tool which will allow people to upload an image and we will inform them instantly that this is a defect or a real video. Yeah, uh, I think that again is the point that we need to fight okay. that with technology. Yeah, please, Tony, go ahead. I was just add that uh, in addition to what you guys do, we're also working on the tools and technologies to be able to test whether that stuff works. So not only you testing whether something is a deep take and the IDVs, but also us testing as a certification model that you'll claim that you can spot a deep fake actually works. So we're we're doing a lot of work on that um, in a project we're working on with Switzerland and the UK. I think yeah. that brings it to a full circle. Yeah, that's really important. These uh, certifications, these, these build trust within the companies uh, on our technology as well for other businesses to trust our technology uh, given that we have the certain certification, certain robustness uh, associated with the technology as well. Yeah. Uh, as far as these regulation challenges are concerned, I think we've talked about most of them. Uh, we've talked about how regulation is still a challenge because of the fact that, you know, different geographical locations, different sort of uh, rules, set of rules everywhere. Um, if we talk about uh, specific bodies, so Tony, what do you think? Uh, just like do you you do have bodies for age verification and assurances? Uh, do specific bodies help the case of defix? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got uh, here in the UK, we've got Ofcom uh, that are currently doing a lot of work on deep fake and on um, uh, the regulation for online safety. Uh, in the European Union, we're, we're going to have the uh, AI Act that's coming in. Uh, that, again, is going to uh, prohibit certain things. Uh, and, but that's going to be enforced at a commission level rather than at a local level, which is um, an interesting change of um of tack from the commission us lots of uh, work going on there with regulation and um uh, uh, and controls coming in there um i think uh, in terms of um uh the the threat of deep fake uh, on underage is is uh, is huge um uh, the you know age verification we we can all agree that there's no point in having age verification if all you got to do is take a picture of you of yourself and say make me look 10 years older um, that's not going to work, yeah. is it? Uh, so uh, coming up with the detection tools for that and how that works, that's fine. Another thing which is slightly linked to deep fakes, but is um, uh, so with deep fakes, you're looking at the presentation of a, 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 a something to a sensor. Uh, with uh, with uh, there's another thing which is video injection attack, which is bypassing the sensor um and and actually in, injecting it into the code in the process and, and and stuff like that so there's all sorts going a lot of work going on it's a very interesting area of activity yeah i think um that's again something that fascia caters to as well protection against injection attacks um because i i saw somewhere there's live video feeds being hacked as well where i could i could be someone else right now uh while speaking to you but i guarantee everyone this is me so uh i think we've discussed uh, pretty coherently on uh, the impact of deepfakes, and if we move to the conclusion, we just uh, we've we've got a busy year ahead. I think Tony, we with the regulations as well, 
and Mujadad with the technology uh, improving of uh, hackers and uh, people who are trying to create defects. Uh, and also distributing it publicly so openly uh, that is that looks to be the greatest challenge especially with the election campaigns and how uh, political uh, candidates from all over the world are going to be talking to their uh, audiences uh, the, the amount of manipulation that goes into it changing narratives uh, we really need to be wary of that as well as 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 from the marketing point of view we want to create uh, a massive level of awareness on that uh, so we, we we bring to the conclusion and for final thoughts, I would ask uh, both of you to uh, share anything if you have and uh, any questions in that aspect. No, it's uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting to uh, hear all of uh, hear all of that and what's going on with, uh, with Deepfakes. I do think that there is, uh, you're absolutely right, that this year and next year is going to be the make or break for um the, the impact of deep fakes on uh, on our you know interaction with society and with the uh, uh id and age, and age verification systems in particular um but uh, yeah there's a lot of work going on. a lot of good people out there uh trying to tackle the problem yeah, yeah. Uh, we at fishy are constantly driving um uh, improving technology uh to help businesses to help governments to help people uh protect their identities throughout the world we have the we have a vision of um verifying eight billion identities, which means anyone from anywhere from uh, any part of the world, uh, within seconds we could verify them. Um, that's our vision that we have, uh, so that we could build trust, uh, foster a safe environment for uh people using uh banking, retail, or any uh, healthcare services, any services, any digital platform. Um, and their identities are safe uh, throughout from onboarding to uh, uses, use, constantly using the services. So we uh, had a question earlier from Simon and Simon is saying like, uh, is there any locations in the world that are responsible for the fakes? Like he's basically trying to, what I think he's trying to ask is like, are there any specific regions from where uh, the fakes are I, mostly I, generated? Yeah. So uh, I would uh, like, honestly, with the world digitally connected, it's a, it's a single world these days. It's a global world. You can't really pinpoint, uh, pinpoint anyone and uh, say that this is the particular region that they fix or originate. Um, anyone from anywhere can uh, create a defect within minutes. Uh, you just have to Google it. Um, it's that easy. Um, however, in the past, um, uh, Russian mafia, Russian... Russian uh, region have been uh, very active uh, with defect. Uh, they have been uh, a bit more advanced in technology as well in terms of uh, using the services. Um, but um, it's not that uh, they are the sole player or anything. They are the only region that uh, has access to these defects. Um, it's literally anyone with an internet connection can create a defect within minutes. Perfect, perfect. So thank you so much, Tony, Mr. Saad, Mr. Mujadid, for joining the webinar. And it's been an honor hosting you guys. And uh, uh, thank you so much for you know uh, creating this awareness and spreading uh, the positive world all over the world. And uh, thanks to all the participants who joined us and uh, have been a part of this from the start of the session. So thank you so much, and uh, I hope uh would you like uh would you guys like to say something in the end and let's just say it call it off yeah perfect thank you for having me yeah uh, it was a great the great talking to you all um to any very insightful information you from you from your end um we as a company would love to work with you guys uh building a better and safer environment throughout the world so that's about it, guys. Uh, hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you so much. See you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.